The only reassuring thing about the fact that millions of people use homeopathy nowadays is that you don't stand the remotest chance of understanding it. While listening to this, one may therefore say, what? and eh? and even go cross-eyed and start to blither if one likes without fear of making a fool of oneself. Nevertheless, an account of how and why it all came about will be provided, and an attempt will be made to explain why nothing works better than homeopathy. In the beginning, medicine was created. This has made a lot of people very happy, and it was widely regarded as a good move. But then, one day in 1796, nearly 200 years after a guy named Galileo was sentenced to imprisonment for telling people how nice it would be for a change to only make a claim if there was enough evidence to support it, a possibly overly excited chap called Samuel Hahnemann introduced a system of alternative medicine, nowadays known as homeopathy. He came up with it while translating a medical treatise by the Scottish physician and chemist William Cullen into German. Being curious of Cullen's theory concerning the use of cinchona for curing malaria, Hahnemann ate some of the bark himself to investigate what would happen. He experienced fever, shivering, and pain in his joints, symptoms surprisingly similar to those of malaria itself. From this, Hahnemann, with questionable logic, came to believe that all effective drugs must in fact produce symptoms in healthy individuals similar to those of the diseases that they treat. This principle, called like cures like, has nothing to do with vaccination. It is based on finding a single drug that produces the same symptoms, but that has no direct relation to the illness itself. So, for example, to treat a cold one might use a remedy based on onions, because onions produce the streaming eyes and runny nose typical of a cold. An interesting additional fact is that in an account of the effects of eating cinchona bark by Oliver Wendell Holmes, published in 1861, he did not report the symptoms that Hahnemann had suffered. So the very reaction Hahnemann seems to have had to the cinchona bark, which led him to the founding principle of homeopathy, like cures like, was probably an allergy. When Hahnemann tried cinchona bark for the first time, he certainly used large quantities of it. On the basis of the like cures like principle, he then began testing other remedies using reasonably large quantities of the ingredients. After a while, he realized that, due to the fact that his remedies actually cause the same symptoms as those of the diseases he was supposed to be curing, they are often extremely toxic, and they were harming his patients more than the original disease itself. When a few people started to accidentally die, he decided that in order to get over this, he could start diluting his preparations. However, he found that by diluting he could eliminate the toxic side effects, but he also lost the healing properties. Nevertheless, he didn't lose heart and came up with a process now known as potentization to handle this difficulty. This is a process in which the substance is diluted with alcohol or distilled water, and is then vigorously shaken. The vigorous shaking of a diluted homeopathic preparation has even been given a name, succession. Hahnemann believed that succession activated the vital energy of the diluted substance, and made it even stronger. There are quite a few stories as to how Hahnemann stumbled across the process of potentization. They range from already diluted remedies being bounced in the back of carriages, to Hahnemann pounding one in frustration on his Bible as he tried to come up with a solution to his problems. Another plausible scenario is that Hahnemann was just having one of those days, where the air is clear and scented, the breeze flits lightly through the tall grass, the birds are chirruping at each other, the butterflies are fluttering about prettily, and the whole of nature seems to be conspiring to be as pleasant as it possibly could, and he was simply in a terrifically good mood. Whatever the truth, Hahnemann determined that a remedy prepared by a simple series of dilutions, interspersed with vigorous agitations, produced an extremely powerful yet safe medicine because of the following two facts, the former probably truer than the latter. Repeatedly diluting the remedy eliminated the toxic potential, and shaking it preserved and even increased the pure essence of the beneficial effects. It should now be reminded to the listener that at that time, mainstream medicine was often quite crude, barbaric, unhygienic and ineffective, using methods such as bloodletting and purging. These treatments often worsened symptoms and sometimes proved fatal. So it doesn't come as a surprise that when Hahnemann rejected these practices and promoted a treatment that involved a less material view of how living organisms function, asserting that the true causes of illness in general are of dynamic, etheric, energy nature, whatever that means, and employing single drugs at lower doses. This was considered by many as a great step forward and was much appreciated. It turns out that homeopaths like diluting and shaking a lot. 
Preparation of homeopathic remedies consists of many, sometimes even 200 or more dilutions and vigorous shakings after each dilution, until, well, here's the catch, none of the original substance is left at all. At the time when Hanuman was alive, matter was thought to be continuous rather than discrete, so it was generally assumed that a remedy could be diluted indefinitely. After more than two centuries of scientific progress, it is now known that matter is composed of molecules and atoms, and the matter can't be divided indefinitely. From this bit of knowledge, it can be easily deduced that homeopathic remedies are often diluted so much that in the final remedy there are no molecules of the original substance. Hahnemann generally used the centesimal or C-scale, diluting a substance by a factor of 100 at each stage. A 30C dilution, for example, requires a substance to be diluted to one part in 100, and then some of that diluted solution to be diluted by a further factor of 100, another 29 times, meaning the original substance is diluted by a factor of 100 to the power of 30 which is equivalent to one molecule of the original substance, dissolved in water contained in a container 30 billion times the size of the Earth. The chance is that, in filling a small flask with the solution in the container, this very molecule would be picked up too, are therefore extremely minimal. However, homeopaths are surprisingly unflabbergasted about the fact that there is not a single molecule of the active ingredient in the remedies that they sell. This is because they somehow came up with the idea. They were also probably under the influence of that terrifically good mood too when they did. The water somehow has a memory of the active ingredient that was originally diluted in it, no matter if the active ingredient is no longer there. They don't know why this is, but they do very helpfully provide the general public with a few preliminary, insignificant, uncontrolled and unreplicated studies that show that homeopathic water has different properties to normal water. The listener should also reflect on the original substances that are being diluted in the first place, as it is thought by many that the whole like cures like argument is not convincing enough to conclude that any particular starting substance for a homeopathic remedy, even if given an immeasurable amount, would have any of the claimed effects. Additionally, water will have been in contact with millions of different other substances throughout its history, from which can be concluded that water is therefore an extreme dilution of pretty much any conceivable substance. Therefore, by drinking water one should in fact receive treatment for every imaginable illness, which admittedly would simply be great. At this point, homeopathy believers tend to defend their belief by claiming that it just works, and that the absence of scientific evidence is not in itself a reason why they should stop using it. Well, the thing is, and this might come as a surprise to the listener, it doesn't work. There are no serious studies that have been done so far that show that homeopathic remedies have any effect on the patient higher than the placebo effect, which is the beneficial effect of the patient following a particular treatment that arises from the patient's expectations concerning the treatment rather than from the treatment itself. The one good thing about homeopaths is, in fact, that they appear to be genuinely nice people and take the time to listen carefully to the patient, which may result in the patient feeling better about him or herself and believing strongly that this time they might actually get better. Homeopathy believers will generally argue that it does, in fact, work, recounting vague incidents that may have happened to them or some of their acquaintances, such as, my son had very dry, itchy skin, and because of homeopathy he was back to normal after only a few days, which they may follow with the question, how do you explain that? It should be made known to the listener that if they happen not to be a homeopathy believer, they may suddenly feel a strong urge to answer with the most violent of language. However, this is not a suggested course of action, as the believers might use this against them, accusing them of having a closed mind and being stuck in their own sceptical certainties. Therefore, it is suggested to count to ten, and further provide them with an equally or more likely alternative explanation, such as, it might have gone away anyway. According to the National Centre for Homeopathy, over 500 million people worldwide use homeopathic medicine. Many of them wonder why homeopathy non-believers get so mad at them for using it. However, most of the non-believers explain their point quite frankly, which is roughly this. Nothing that has ever happened with homeopathy could possibly make the slightest bit of sense. Believing in ridiculous theories is not a sign of having an open mind. They hold that homeopathic companies have been offending humankind's dignity and intelligence for quite some time now lying and providing insubstantial evidence to substantiate their theories. They further claim that's more than enough to justify their anger.